Hi, this is Pastor Joe Johnson, and welcome to His Kingdom Now. And I'm really glad that you're joining us this week as we open up the Word of God and we study principles concerning His kingdom that will allow us to see the will of God and His kingdom come on the earth as surely as these things are done in heaven. You know, we live in some very crazy times right now, and yet Jesus personally guaranteed that when we hear His sayings and we do them, we are assured to come out on top every single time. So again, I'm glad that you're joining us. God bless and enjoy the service. Amen. All right. Well, today what we're going to do, call today's service is don't leave your post. And before we keep going, I want to thank, uh, raise your hand if you're a veteran. Uh, Veterans Day, so we want you all stand up. We want to, I'm a veteran as well, why don't you stand up? We want to thank you for your service, you may be seated, and uh, uh, we're just very, very grateful, and those of us who have family members now that are in the service, um, uh, it is a sacrifice. There's no doubt when I was in, I had a lot of fun, I did a lot of th things that weren't godly, that's true. Um, I was young, I was in my young early 20s, but make no mistake, when you swore to defend the Constitution, your country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, you were primarily a fighter. And at any given time, and all the education, and all the benefits of being a veteran and being in the service, you swore an oath, and that is you're going to fight to protect and to liberate. And that's a serious responsibility. And if you're in, you can get called on doing that at any time. So thank you, uh, everybody. Those of you who are watching my live stream, thank you for your service and also for your uh, family as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to continue. I've been talking on, uh, as I shared with you last week, uh, Paul's letter uh, to the Galatian churches. I've been uh, spending a lot of time, as a matter of fact, 95 plus percent of my time uh, reading in the past month or so. Uh, the Lord had put it on my heart, just stay in the book of Galatians. Just keep reading it over and over and over. In other words, do you know that if you, you, can, if you were to parachute into a foreign country, and you just landed there, and you didn't know anybody else that spoke English, but you just landed in the middle of this tribe, the middle of this nation. Did you know within a matter of time, if you were inundated 24-7, eventually you would take on their mannerisms. You'd begin to learn their language. You would actually, if they even had some English dialect, you would take on their accents. In other words, your mind has, and soul was meant to conform. It'll really transform to the environment uh, that you're in, and you'll take on the mannerisms, you'll take on the customs. Well, you can do exactly the same thing in the Word of God. You can do the exact same thing. You can parachute yourself in every, everything that's written about in the Word of God. You can do the same thing, and that's what I'm doing in Galatians, what I'm doing, and I did that in the book of Ephesians years ago, and that's where that book came from. In other words, you just drop yourself into that book and just read it over and over and over again, and as I talked about, and when we talk, teach on meditation, uh, meditating the Word of God, it's important when you do this to take a lot of time in your reading, uh, not thinking that you know what it's talking about. A lot of times we read the Word of God and we think we already know what it means, and so we just blow over whole sections. Well, what if your interpretation of it is completely wrong? You've messed up what you're going to be able to get out of what God was saying in that book. And so what I do, and I'm in the process of doing it right now with Paul's letter to the Galatians and, and going into, uh, and again, I, I've been at this a long time. I mean, if you would ask me on the street, I can tell you, yep, I can tell you the cities he's in, I can tell you when, I can tell you it's his first letter he wrote, I can tell you what the background is. But it's, it, it'll do something for you if you'll go into it pretending it's the, and acting like it's the very first time you've ever read those things. As a matter of fact, how many of you ever heard of a fellow by the name of T.L. and da Daisy Osborne? Did you ever hear of them? Okay. Well, T.L. and Daisy Osborne, they had gone over to India. They got turned on to the things of God. They were ministry, filled with the Holy Ghost, pastored for a while. And then they went over to India. God had put on their heart to go to India. And they spent over a year in India, and they couldn't get anybody. They couldn't get a single convert. Nothing was happening. And they'd get into arguments and discussions with the Muslims and with the Hindus. And what it basically, the, what was coming down was that the argument was, who has the better scriptures? Because no one was proving it by power. 
So it turned into an argument of dialects, languages, and reliability. In other words, the argument was solical. It wasn't spiritually based in power. So they came back, and they were defeated. They were bummed out. And uh, so what they did was, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with it. And uh, so they went into fasting and prayer and began to hang out with some miracle ministries. They started hanging out with uh, William Branham and seeing things that were just mind-boggling in the move of the Spirit. And what I said two minutes ago is what's leading me to T.L. and Daisy Osborne. They determined they were going to begin to start reading the Gospels as if it was the very first time they'd ever read it. And what happened was, is they went into this, even with all their years of experience, they went into it with the attitude, this is going to be the first time we're going to be introduced to Jesus. Well, I'll make a long story short, he had a personal visitation with Jesus. It knocked him out for 12 hours. Jesus personally showed up. And T.L. and Daisy Osborne were the pioneers of mass, 100, 200, 300,000 people 100,000 people crusades with signs, wonders, and miracles. And I'm not talking about headaches, documented cripples and blind eyes and deaf ears. And whether it was in Africa, uh, whether it was down in South America, God visited them. And how could he do that? Well, one of the things they'd attribute it was their lack of power went back to not understanding, that applying what they thought the scriptures meant and not seeing fresh how necessary these things were. And that's what I'm doing with Galatians. And that's what I want to encourage you guys to do when it comes to the Word of God. And I drill this regularly here. Know why you believe what you believe. And take the time. Listen, not just a cursory perusal. You're, you're reading your chapter while you're going to the bathroom in the morning of Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest, is not diligent Bible study. We need to be people of the Word of God. We need the Word of God. We can, as I use that illustration, we can literally parachute into that world. Because remember, if there is no scripture that's of human will and private interpretation, that means the same Holy Spirit that was writing through Paul to that letter, he's on the inside of you. And if you give him any amount of time, and then especially if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you kick in praying in tongues, oh my gosh, it just doesn't stop getting so good you'll hardly be able to stand yourself. And the, excuse me, and the Holy Spirit will take you into that world. Well, that's what I've been doing in the book of Galatians. And last week, <coughs> excuse me, we'll review just a couple of principles, but then I want to go on. <coughs> if you saw my email this morning or if you saw on um, uh, Facebook, uh, there's one word specifically uh, that we're going to take a, take a look at. Let's give you a little backdrop on uh, the book of Galatians and what he was talking about. In Acts chapter 15, he was talking about this. He says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas, certain others of them, should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, the reason why I brought us there, which I didn't do last week, is is when we, as we discover and go through Paul's letter to the Galatian church, he uses some crazy strong language. And the backdrop is, is what was happening. And now, now understand this. This actually would make sense to a Jewish believer. And I'll tell you why. If you remember, now even way back, Abraham was justified by faith. They, were, they knew that, and they had their sacrifice. They knew that goats and bulls, they knew that that was not the Messiah, but they were trusting in blood. They were trusting in that there was a sacrifice for their sins. Now get this, they were trusting in the sacrifice to cover their sin, but they still knew they needed to follow the law. Well, what we before, and Paul really blasts these guys, but let's get in their head. The reason why, and it's reasonable, if you're one of these Jewish believers to go, well, of course you need to follow the law. In other words, what they, they would be thinking based on their past, look, we've had lambs before, we still had to follow the law. Okay, Jesus was the Lamb of God, but we know, even though we got a lamb, we still got to follow the law. Now, that's reasonable, except for, and we'll re I'm really going to hammer it next week. Remember last week I said, in chapter, Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul said this. The one argument, the one point that he wanted to make, was, he says, all right, you guys, you want to go back on the law. He said, this one thing I know, I want to know from you. Did you receive the Spirit 
By the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Does he who supplies the Spirit and work miracles among you do it by the works of the law or hearing of faith? In other words, Paul's contention was, hey boys, you don't stop at Jesus being the Lamb of God. It doesn't end until you understand you have a new nature. You are a new creation in Christ. The end game of this sacrificial Lamb, the Messiah, is that you become born again. The Spirit of the living God lives on the inside of you and the powers of the age to come, they live inside of you. No law can give you access to those things. So I'm not, I really don't have much of, as much of a problem as I've been meditating this out. And again, I've been at this a long time, but you go, in, go into their world, it would make sense if you were a Jewish believer, and especially, and it was, it was a group of the Pharisees, the Pharisees had come to see him. Or we're trying to get these guys to get circumcised and follow the law. If Jesus, and see, this is where we make a mistake, and we're seeing it even today. I've watched apologists get on Larry King. I've got watched these guys argue over whether Islam and Hindu and all, and they always, I haven't seen anybody, I'm talking about like the who's who's of fundamental reformist theology. Their argument is always, you have to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. That's true, but that's not what resulted, because Muhammad will say he has the way. Oh, and by the way, I'll just lob this out there. And for those of you watching by TV, you'll get people say one of the biggest things they trip up over is the um, exclusionary nature of Christianity. Well, guess what? They're all exclusionary. They all Christianity Christianity doesn't have a monopoly on it. Jesus isn't the only one who said he was the only way. So again, back to, if you're just trying to say, well, you need to get saved because my holy book said you have to be justified in faith. That's all you've got, and you're going to argue left and right, and the only power is a matter of who is mentally more skilled at the moment. But I'll tell you what, when you call the wheelchair case up, and you start getting them out of wheelchairs, and opening blind eyes, and you start praying in other tongues, and showing you come from another creation, boy, that just settles everything. Go ahead and do that, Mr. Fundamentalist and Mr. Hindu. You want to know what I said? That's what John Lake would do. He He was in Africa one time, and they had this big... Uh, uh, all these different religions had, had come, and they were going to uh, take a night, and they were going to argue the benefits of, of their religion and why theirs was the best one. And, and uh, he just sought the Lord. All right, how am I going to do that? Because he was hearing some pretty intellectual people. And it wasn't like John Lake was, was some kindergarten-trained guy. I mean, he was, he was pretty on theologically. Well, the Lord told him what to do. He says, all right, it's my turn. But before I get started, who's the most sick person in this room? There were thousands of people there. Well, they brought up a guy who was paralyzed. He was in a wheelchair. Prayed for him in the name of Jesus. What do you think happened? That guy got right up. You know, there's a lot of arguments that go away. And the point that I'm making is, is, is saints, the end game, thank God I have been justified by faith. I'm so grateful for a Savior that rose again for me. By his stripes, I've been healed. But the end game was not the doctrine of those things. The end game is God has unioned himself with me. I have the nature of God on the inside of me. I am not, a, uh, I am not part of a humanity that was the same from Adam and Eve. He's created a new humanity. We're sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. My justification by faith resulted in something. Not a new doctrine that I appeal to because Jesus was awesome. I appeal to this nature that was the result of the inside of me. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians, he said, but there's one thing I'm appealing to you. I just want to know one thing. And Gosstown Harvest Christian Church, listen, if, you, if, if you're worn out, you're tired, you don't know where to go, what to do, I challenge you to fall back in love and worship Jesus and praise God and pray in the Holy Ghost. Reignite, stir that gift on the inside of you. Recognize you are a new humanity. You were not the same. You're a new, all the old things passed away. All things became new. The Spirit of God's the fire of your soul, and there is no law that can beat that. None. There's no argument that can beat that. So we talked about last week. And I kind of was baiting you just, I threw out the word, you know, about being cursed and what those things could be. And we learned about a curse is to invoke a power, mean to cause something, or cause harm to another. A solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. Curses are bad. You do not want to be cursed. 
They're very, very bad, and they're very real. Well, it so happens that we find out in the New Testament, even believers can come under a curse. And those two curses are, uh, number one, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be cursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So the first way that someone even in the New Testament can come underneath a curse is to begin to think, to listen, let alone be the preacher of someone that's teaching something different than the New Testament first century church, the faith once and for all delivered to every one of us. I just started an article this week, and you, <coughs> you can Google it, look it up. I'm not going to tell you her name. Uh, but there is a, uh, a Lutheran, uh, I wouldn't, you can't call her a priest, minister, liberal Lutheran minister, and she advocates and she believes that all, not all porn is bad. What? That there's actually ethically produced porn that you should be able to watch all the time. You know, in Romans chapter 3, when he was talking about, you know, there's people that say we ought, to be, we ought to do bad things so that good may come. And he says their condemnation is just. Her condemnation is just. It is. And I'm telling you what, while she's still breathing, she better repent. Because she's coming in and she's changing this gospel. He says that, you're going to be cursed. You especially, and think about how, remember, Paul had no small dissension. Paul and Barnabas, they went at it with these guys. And I'll give you a heads up. If you know God, there's going to be times you've got to know your stuff. This whole idea, well, you know what? I just don't want to argue with anybody. I just don't want to get into anybody. It's a private affair. Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. Saints, my job is to get you so you got enough in your brain so not only can you hold on and protect your own salvation, you might be able to help somebody else from believing something stupid. Amen. <clears throat> Listen, the world has no problem getting in your face and telling you what you ought to believe. And a lot of that's going on because there's no pushback. There's no pushback. Well, you know, preachers shouldn't get involved in politics. Did you know if you vote, you're involved with politics? Yeah. You ever heard of a guy by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Yeah. Okay, he was only of almost 20,000 ministers in Germany at the time of Hitler. He was only one of 2,000 that stood up and called out the Nazi party for what it was. Look, if there's a political party out there believing in slaughtering babies all over the place and storming people's houses and putting spray paint and anarchy signs, I'm calling them out. And the man died two weeks before Germany was liberated. And he could, he did not have to go, he didn't have to go back. He was in New York and he was in New England. But God had given him such a passion because he saw the evils, not just of Hitler, but he saw the, the evils of what was going on through that whole ideology and the philosophy. And he wrote, he relentlessly wrote and spoke against the evils of the political environment and the people that were following. Listen, Hitler forced, got himself involved in the religious arena. When you hear some, when you hear a politician, I'll even say it, when Hillary stands up and says we have to change old style, old fashioned religious beliefs. Who do you think she's talking to? Do you know Hitler got involved with the religious, with, with doctrine in the church in Germany as well? And he got the clergy and he got these churches to agree with him. And event, listen, just because government legalizes it doesn't mean it's right. Amen. And the only, and thank God for De Dietrich Bonhoeffer's. Thank God for Charles Finney's. But you know what? I want my generation to go thank God for Gosstown Harvest Christian Church. Yeah. Thank God for sons of God that will speak up. And listen, I'll say, and this is all free, but it started from, again, Paul, no small dissension. Someone's got to start filling our stadiums and calling our nation back to repentance to God. This is not a gun issue. It deals with guns and mental health, but I'll tell you what, you can do all of those things, but if you don't call the evils of a society for what it is, we are, this generation is self-centered and wicked, and until you teach it that there is a right or a wrong, listen, if, I, if you've grown up from pond scum, if you really believe that you were evolved anyway, and there is absolutely no responsibility to any moral 
reign of any god or any king. If you don't have that, how are you even stepping in and saying what's right and what's wrong? Someone's got to start standing up and saying, this is what God says. And say, well, that's old-fashioned. Listen, there's nothing old-fashioned about your spirit man. Your spirit man, it doesn't matter how much it's been dumbed down, your spirit man is meant to respond to the word of God. You'll have an amazing revival in our nation, but you've got to stand up and preach what God said, not what you're afraid to say, and create all these games and these systems of entertainment because you don't want to offend it anybody the word of God listen sin needs to be offended and not everybody's going to listen and listen I'll tell you and why, again this is I, I could go on for hours because it's crazy when you parachute into this world when you go back Acts 13 through and up to 15 is when Paul was in the Galatian region see when he was in Galatia one of the miracles, it only talks about the one miracle specifically that he had, when he, well, actually two, the one guy. And Paul could be snarky, by the way. I love that new word snarky. Did you know when he was sitting there talking to the proconsul on the island, and that guy, uh, uh, the, the Limus, the sorcerer, stood up and tried to resist him? Paul what, got angry with him. He didn't bow his head and go, oh, Jesus is wonderful. He says, you child of the devil? And the dude went blind, man. It's time to start calling things out. Child of the devil, you're not going to teach people this stuff anymore. But you've been so beaten down through the news media and the pressure of society, you're afraid to even say something. But think, but think about this. The other miracle that happened in the Galatian region, Paul was preaching. Oh, and he saw the crowd, and then he saw a guy that had been crippled from never walked a day in his life. Paul's preaching, and he obviously had a crowd, but he saw one man. And he saw that he had faith to be healed. Get up now. He stood up. He's healed. Listen, that one miracle had so much power that the crowds from the cities came around him. The priest for Zeus wanted to offer uh, sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas because saying they are the gods themselves. But here's the other side of it, what I, what I wanted to point at. Listen. Back to, you know, some people are going to like you, some people are going to hate you. In the middle of even pagan priests wanting to worship Paul because there was so much power, the Jewish, the Judaizers were coming from other towns, and that's where Paul got stoned and they killed him. So here you have one group of people that responded incredibly to the word of God. The other side tried to kill him. And by the way, don't ever let anybody ever teach you again. And Paul was talking about his infirmity in Galatians that he had ophthalma, he was blind, and all this other, and that God made him sick. You want to know what his infir infirmity was? Tell me, how do you die when you get stoned? How do you die? You get stoned, the rocks smash your head in. And it says he was there many days and for a long time preaching the thing. You want to know what his infirmity was? They had to drag him out. He was dead. And they put up with him. And one of the things they had to put up with the fact is here's these guys trying to kill him. Do we really want to protect them? That's why he said they would get, you'd even give your lives for me. Why? Because they might have. And it says very clearly after he got up and he got done. You know what he got done after he got his health back? He went right back and went right back through the cities that had just tried to kill him. Well, you know, all those Christians are just hypocrites. I got no time for church. I don't want, you know, none of those people, I don't want to be around those people. I don't want, one of the greatest signs of your immaturity and a religious spirit is to think you shouldn't be around the other children of God in church. Especially, listen, uh, I heard someone, and I, there, here's a line that I'll say sometimes, someone like, oh, pastor, you're just awesome. I go, oh, you must be looking in the mirror. Well, when someone starts condemning other brothers and sisters, calling them hypocrites, he's looking into a mirror. If you got any spiritual meat on your bones, you're going back right when it's the worst, not where it's the best. So Paul had some history in the Galatian region. He had history. And he said, look, unwritten uh, but understood, I went through all that I did in the Galatian region. And now you're listening to these people come and preach another gospel. Let them be accursed. 
And we talked about this last week when it says Paul said when he went and when he went to that Acts chapter 15 meeting, he said, I went there, he says, and I talked to these guys to make sure I hadn't run in vain. He says this is in chapter four of Galatians when he's talking about to these guys, he says, Look, have I taught you and done these things to you in vain? In other words, not was I wrong, but was I wasting my time? Are you telling me for a second Paul preached a gospel for 14 years, personally instructed by Jesus, and he was worried whether he was right or not? He said concerning those guys, he says, they didn't add anything to me. He says, and besides that, God's no respecter of persons anyway. Paul was snarky. He knew who he was, but he knew who he was because he knew what he was talking about. Gosstown Harvest Christian Church, let's know what we're talking about. So as innocent or as reasonable as it may seem, okay, yeah, we had a lamb of God die for us. But we had lambs before. We, certainly we should be circumcised and follow the law. Paul went nuts over that. And the reason why, and we're finding out, is once again this one thing I want to know. The end game and to the degree you discover with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit, what has taken place in your new nature is to the degree you become unbeatable by the devil. Because you'll appeal to the life of God, the nature of God on the inside of you, not simply your mental reasoning powers. So, that was one of them. We talked about this. Where did Paul get his authority to say what he said? Remember last week, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that I preached, or was preached by me, is not man's gospel. Come on. <clears throat> For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Peter, Cephas is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of the fellowship. In other words, what he's doing is he's telling us his authority. My authority comes from, this is Paul, I mean, Paul is saying my authority comes from, number one, God the Father and the Lord Jesus chose me. I didn't choose myself. No one else picked me. He did. Number two, I wasn't taught this by Peter, James, and John. Jesus was my personal instructor. As surely as Peter, James, and John and the 12, and then all the 120 in the upper room and all those that had followed him, that Jesus was their personal instructor. Paul's personal instructor was the Lord Jesus himself who appeared to him alive and well. And third, he says, and just in case, because he was was taking a baseball bat to anything, any drop, any idea that you could add to the nature of Christ by doing something in your own power. Thirdly, he said, look, he says, there's nobody that added to my gospel. So not only do I have God's approval and I'm taught by Jesus, even the pillars of the church had to say, yeah, he's got the goods. He's called to the Gentiles as Peter's going to the Jews. And then later on, just to show how much authority he had, and he was not refuted, Peter himself got into hypocrisy and Paul called him on it. And that is in the word of God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Paul knew his stuff. And he was setting the stage for what authority he had to make the statements that he had. Secondly, we talked about this. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. And now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. And we learned last week, the curse of the law and trying to be justified by the law is, is that the law could never get you. You thinking you're good enough and appealing to your own strength for anything from God, what it does is it turns the faucet off and it makes unavailable to you the nature of God on the inside. Remember, the end game was not simply faith in Christ. That that's where it starts. That's the door that got you into the room called I'm born again. Old things passed away and all things became new. God and man have become one. That's what my faith in Christ Jesus did for me. And the curse of the law is I don't get union with God any other way but faith in Christ. Go back and watch the TV program during the week and listen to that statement again. The curse of the law is that no matter how good you are, who's going to do who's going to deal with the things that you didn't do? The curse of the law, and we're not getting into it today. The law was given. Look, if there was a law that was given that could make you right, it was the law. But it confined us. It constricted us. 
But the scripture, the law, imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. How many of y'all have ever said to yourself, let alone heard someone, well, you know what? I'm a good person. I can get to heaven. You're cursed and you're imprisoned. You're actually this. You're this. Oh, pastor, I would never think that. Really? When was the last time? And this is why it was. Past month, I've, I've taken the, Pastor Greg was really busy with the stuff, and I just decided I was going to do it as far as the offerings. But that's why I spent so much time just thanking you guys. You're great. You're awesome. Now, you're smart enough to, to not trust in your own strength and your own works to get to heaven. But I'll tell you what, you ever give in to one of those preachers that tell you, you give a thousand right now? Just give it because there's a special anointing on me to give you. Just give a thousand right now. It's a hundred gazillion fold return. You ever hear that nonsense here in this church? If I haven't taken that individual out, you can. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about sowing, re- there's a lot of principles and stuff, but any, and I shared with you uh, my personal story how there were things in God that He's having me believe for. And I kept adding religious thoughts to the end of it, going, well, I, I better sound spiritual about this. I was tacking on legalism to that thing, and I didn't even know I was doing it. And I was making it justified that God would do something for me. You know what? Grace, certainly it trains us to say no to ungodliness and things like that. But grace, unmerited favor, I'll tell you what, you'd be amazed at how when you pray, the clock goes away because you don't care how many hours or minutes you pray because it's not even a factor anymore. You're just talking to Jesus. And if that wave takes you for two, three, four hours in the, in the spirit, great. And if it takes you five minutes because the kids are screaming, they want to get up from the nap and you got to cook or go do the laundry, great. But you begin to live and you begin to ebb and you begin to flow with God. And if you don't understand those things to whatever degree, you're that guy right there. And there's a lot of Christians that are in prison right now. There's, there's Christians that walk away from their faith because something didn't work out for them. My gosh, the things that, you know, that'd be like me saying, that'd be like me going, you know, I trust God. You know, Jesus could even do this. Whether it's the Empire State Building or the temple. Why don't I just jump off? Because certainly the angels will protect him. And you know what? I think gravity is too restrictive. I just think it's judgmental and bigoted and I'm free. And I'm going to, as I jump off the Empire State Building, I'm going to wave to all you guys, obviously so confined in those rooms looking through the window. Don't you see how free I am? You're free for about a minute and a half. There's laws you don't violate. And there's a lot of folks out there, they violated laws, they didn't get their answer, and so they couldn't possibly be wrong, so let's blame God. (laughs) I've had to accept the fact, especially the things I'm asking for in God, it takes time to develop some chops in the spirit world. How many times did Thomas Edison not get the light bulb he got? I'm thinking of a good friend of mine right now, um, stands in front of uh, two, three hundred thousand people. I can call him right now. Pinadari Sai Rambabu. He's got another place now where limbs are growing out in his meetings now. This is in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Did you know the first year when he started praying for the sick, not one single person got healed under his ministry? And I've talked to him about it. He says, I just know that the word of God said what it said, and it didn't matter what happened. The Word of God said what it said. <clears throat> In other words, he wouldn't quit. He knew it couldn't be God's fault. Amen. Amen. It was not God's fault that the light bulbs didn't work for Thomas Edison. It's not God's fault. He just didn't have it right. Well, he slid into something. Well, we've got the power, we've got the... Well, we do, but if you don't know how, if you're not Thomas Edison and work through it, because let me tell you something, when you pray for... You want to know how a person gets healed? 
I'll tell you what happens, and Paul demonstrated it for, was when he talked about the life of Christ. He said the life of Jesus made, uh, manifest in our bodies through the dying of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, Peter, uh, uh, Jesus said this, he says, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then know the kingdom of God is heaven up, uh, coming upon you. Literally what happens when you pray for someone and a devil comes out or they get healed, you squeeze, you apply pressure on your inner man, and depending on how much comes out at the time is what you're going to be able to produce, and whether that's a cold or a wheelchair. Jesus said, if you speak to this mountain, he didn't say God, and they didn't even say, when he was talking about what several things you ask for in prayer, believe you receive them, you should, you should have them. All right, when he says talking about fig trees, wilting fig trees and mountains, those weren't religious prayers. It was a mountain and a fig tree. But the inherent power that is available in this world, accessed by faith, and when you squeeze and it's made known through your words and through your speaking, you're either good at that or you're not. And if you're not good at it and you weren't strong enough to lift something off of you, it's not the power's fault, it's not God's fault, you're just not strong enough yet, and I'll bet you haven't been in church for a year either. Going to school. We figure we just can, we just, because I read a verse one day, I can just go and do it. Our heroes in faith lived in obscurity for 40, 50 years before they showed up being able to do something. You know what they were doing? They were in old, uh, musky, musty basements, praying in tongues, studying, believing God for a cold to get healed. What were they were doing? They were flexing, they were practicing, they get stronger. You want to run around talking about all the power you got? Then go to a hospital and show me what you got. And if you're not demonstrating it, you don't know much of it as, as you possibly, you don't know about, as much about it as you should. Because this is what Peter said. He said, if you go, well, I'm having fun, by the way. When you have something, you know you have it. Silver and gold I have not. All right, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Paul, we just talked about it, and he didn't pray to God to get healed. He told him, get up. They knew what we had. And I don't have to confess. Once I know I have, like I'm not confessing I have a car I'm going to get into here in about 15 minutes. I have it. And people are getting tired of hearing us talk about things. They're getting tired of turning on TV. And thank God for all of those things. But I'll tell you what, Christians are getting worn out. They're getting worn out because they're seeing words only and not in demonstration of the spirit and power. And their faith, they're getting tired of resting their faith in the wisdom of men instead of the power of God. And they should get tired of it. But I'll tell you what, if I want to bulk up, I can have all the faith in the world. I'm not bulking up unless I'm getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning doing my push-ups and my sit-ups and lifting my weights. I can have all the faith in the world. I got work to do. And the same comes to the working in the spirit world as well. You got to have it. That was all free, by the way. Curse of the law stems from the futility of it. It's impossible to get it all right. No matter how hard you try, you are condemned to failure just the way God designed it. He meant the law to frustrate the daylights out of you so you cry out for a Savior. And this is where we ended last week. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And you remember the movie scene we showed last week? It was the last scene in the movie Taken. Okay. And he makes it through. Of course, he beats everybody's head in. It's awesome. So he t here's, here's this guy. He's got the man's daughter by the throat. And he starts to say, we can negotiate. Bam, takes him out. And what was the daughter's response? <laughs> you came for me. And the father said, I, I told, told you. you I would. Until we understand our redemption, that Jesus, by the will, because of the will of the father, he came into this age. And he rescued us. He came for us. As his bride, we should never lose that raw emotion of gratefulness. He came for me. He came for me. And the more you appreciate that lust, you'll just stop wanting to live stupid. Just stupid. But you're getting tired of hurting people. I know, I can't tell you, and I've been at this for a while. I still run into it. And I kind of like, I know what I'm doing in God, right? I'll still run into times where, God, I just hate thinking too much about myself. 
You know, they, it's going to be a gift to you when you stop thinking you're so flipping more important than your family, than your friends, than your kids, let alone your God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You need to get a revelation of your wretchedness. And like that daughter, just cry out and say, you came for me. Aren't you getting tired of being wretched? You stink. And it's not all about you. I remember raising my kids up. Some of you heard this story. I used to raise my kids. I said, regrets are inevitable. Just do your best to have as few as possible when you die. And ask yourself every day when you get up, how many regrets are you storing up for that day you take your last breath? And then the haunting that your family and your friends, let alone your God, is going to have because you were so consumed with yourself that you going up with it. Now, the blood will cleanse you. If you're saved, you get to go to heaven. Thank God, unless you renounce him. Yes, you can lose your salvation. It's piling regrets, 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 regrets. Is it really worth it to hurt those people? Is it worth it to hurt yourself? Remember I told you when we were praying, I felt the prophetic anointing kicking on me. He's talking to a bunch of us in here. Because it doesn't matter. It can be outward stuff. But some of you just beating the daylights out of yourself too. He came for you. This is the last, this is where we're going to end. I didn't know I'd review that long, but it was fun. I prayed a lot this week. I knew something was going to happen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to another gospel. Depending on the law and yourself for God's approval is an act of desertion. Do you guys know who that is? Oh, Bergdahl. He's so serious. Remember, the Lord Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, remember, this is not man's own interpretation. God is saying through Paul, this is Jesus talking, you are guilty of desertion when you leave the gospel that's been preached by these guys. That's how serious he takes this. It's another one that'll bless you. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. You are severing yourself from Christ any time you want to appeal to any merit. I'm not talking about spiritual law, sowing and reaping. Those are laws. I'm talking about appealing to your own self, your own strength, your own righteousness, your own so-called goodness, all of those things. Not only are you guilty of desertion, so when someone says, well, I'm good enough, I did this, I made sure I said 10 of these prayers, I did all of this. You start going down that road of that vocabulary, you're guilty of desertion, and you're also severing yourself from Christ. He's going one way, you're going another. Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, did not take this lightly. Well, Pastor, what's that got to do with me today? You got about 20 gazillion religions and people that are promoters of them that get in your face and say theirs is just as valid as Jesus. You're finding out why that's not the case. At all. It's not the case at all. And we'll close with this. I got a trip. I get, I'm on my way down to Norfolk here this afternoon. I keep bringing this back to, and I want to encourage you, the pattern in the New Testament was consistently, overwhelmingly, it wasn't God loves you, though that's true. It wasn't today is going to be your best day. That may be true. The f- number one consistent, you're healed, blessed, that's not even number one. 
Number one, the number one consistent, it all starts with the resurrection and repent from your sins. The rest came after. The resurrection validate the eyewitness. Paul was an eyewitness. Paul was an eyewitness. You go on, I'll tell you what, I get asked on Larry King or Bill Maher. I'm not talking about faith in Christ till I establish the resurrection. Because that's what they did. And then we're going to find out that the resurrection paid the price to do something you couldn't and you need to be saved from your sins. Am I going to keep talking to a spiritual blind person? I'll talk to you for about five or ten minutes, but if you're still going to be a horse's patoot, then we're done. And I'm walking off the stage. How do you spell patoot? He just asked that. <laughs> People are trying. <laughs> All right? And what we're doing is don't get sucked in. Fall in love with the Savior that rose again from the dead. Have your own eyewitness accounts. Have your own testimonies. Have your own experiences in God. All right? But don't get drawn into, in the Apostle Paul, vehemently, vehemently resisted any message. And you can, according to the authority of the Scriptures, Someone comes in, they try to bring anybody else in next to Jesus, that message is accursed. And so is the messenger. <sighs> Jesus. He's so good. He's so good. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that every service is orchestrated by you. I thank you and I give you praise and honor. I want to thank you. Lord, there were a lot of things we touched on today. I got to semi-stick with my notes. And I know, and you were talking to me. Even while I was ministering, I had things bouncing around my head. It's like, oh yeah, watch out for that. And if I'm getting it while I'm talking... I know there's people in here getting it. So, Father, in Jesus' name, the grace of God is here to say no to ungodliness. And that includes being foolish theologically. That includes being foolish before you, certainly our loved ones. And, Father, we just want to repent right now in, our, in the privacy of our own spirit. Right now, everyone here in this room, just listen. Listen to whatever he's addressing you on today. I, he had me hit a lot of things. Basically, it was sweep. Almost everybody should be dealing with something. No one, no one thing was getting picked on. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. You can look up for a second. This is one thing, I'm gonna, and I'm going to pray for this for you guys, and then I got to go. I, I, I got called last night. I'm, I'm heading out. Just for a back Tuesday. It's not a long trip. But And I've shared this with people. Um, Brother Dinekern talks about, I've talked to you about Brother Dinnerkin before, and I remember years ago he talked about when he was taken up to um, he was taken up to the throne of heaven saw Jesus all those things, well anyway he was brought before the throne of God and he heard the Father ask what do you want and the Holy Spirit was right there, told him what to ask for well I've never forgotten that story he says, tell him you want more of Jesus. Holy Spirit told him, he said, tell the Father you want more of Jesus. And that's what he did. And I'd say someone standing in front of a half a million people. And this guy would call out names, first, last names, addresses, all that sort of stuff. And go, this is who you are, this is what's going on, let alone the miracles. But I've never forgotten that. And you know, if you're going to get good at anything, like if you're going to get good at tennis... You're going to serve a thousand balls a day. You're going to hit backhands. You're going to practice. Well, I've practiced that question. I've practiced when whoop, there's John Sick standing before the Father. And I know what I know that I know I'm going to ask him. And I'm bringing this up because this is what I'm going to pray for Gosstown Harvest. I'm going to ask him, and I, I ask him in prayer anyway, but this is what I want to ask him. He goes, what do you want? Now, Charlton Heston, I need him here. 
Because that's how God talks. With the little echo in there. And oh. I know what I want. I want to be a man. I want to be a man. You had in your head what you saw a man being, and we see that in Jesus. I want to be a man. And I'll pray for that today for Gosstown Harvest Christian Church. Especially men, I'm going to pray that you're men. That you grow up. Get some testosterone in your veins. Get some snarky. Get edge. I was talking to someone the other day. Someone was, was oh, Chris. I was talking with Ken, Ken and uh, Christian were over there. We were talking about different people having a hard time. You want to know, what, in my opinion, one of the reasons why a lot, especially men, they backslide, because there's no edge. Any kind of snarkiness is beaten out of you in the, in the name of, well, just be soft and sweet and be like doves. Paul wasn't a dove. Jesus wasn't a dove. You better get out of my face. You know what? There's a lot of, especially men, they backslid because they haven't seen men. And sometimes Christian men need to be taken back in the shed and get taken out because they're acting like idiots. You've been hearing too much about grace when you need to hear a little bit more about judgment. You better stop acting like a jerk because you're going to lose everything. That's snarkiness. That's edgy. And then go and do something that may not be, I mean, just go do something rough and tough and go get dirty. And don't take a shower for a day or so. I mean, stink real good. Get an edge to you. And wives, you let, you let your stinky husband sleep next to you because he's a man. You can wear all the perfume you want. You let him stink because he's a man. We need some edge. But I want to be a man. And I'm going to pray that for this church and then we're going to get going. That we fully discover this new nature because it's been given back to us. That as sons of God, we discover our sonship. Our generation needs sons of God, not just churchgoers. Does that make sense? Let's pray again. Father, we want to be men. I'm praying for myself and I'm praying over this church. Sons of God, Father, I'm asking for the grace of God to come upon us. Father, I'm asking for an edge. I'm asking, Father, for the fires of God, the fires of God to fill us. Father, for the judgments of God to come upon your house, to come upon us. Father, we would just get out of our own way. We would just fall in love with fire. Getting burns all right. We're not going to get consumed by it. It's part of our nature. Father, I just believe now for this church to be touched. Father, I believe that everyone in this room is, going to, is repenting right now from, from whatever it is that you dealt with them. And that as of today, many in this room will say, this was a new day for me. This is a new day. Old things really are passing away today. All things are becoming new today. I'm tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of being an awful witness of the gospel to my generation, to my family, to myself, to my God. And I'm full steam. I'm coming after the things of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Greg, you got something? Um, during the worship, during the time of worship, the Lord was, he was challenging me, and he said, I'm waiting for ministry. I'm waiting for somebody to minister to me. I said, but we're singing to the Lord. And the Lord was saying that he never asked for anybody to sing to him. But he did ask for people to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and visit those in jail. And that is ministry to him. And that's what you see as ministry to him. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to sing uh, to Jesus, but a lot of times... We come to church with, I want more of Jesus. And we say that from warm houses and full refrigerators. And we say that from a comfortable posture. And we bypass people who don't even have any of that to come here and say, 
I want more. As if what he has given me is never is not enough, so I need more. But now the the half of what I have has never even been shared with some we walk by on a regular basis to come here to ask for more. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to ask for more, but I believe Jesus is saying, I want, I'm looking for ministry. And I'm not trying to be a downer or a heavy on on your message, which was awesome. Um, but I turned to Suzanne and I said, you know, do you just want to go down to Veterans Park after all this and just minister to some people? And, of course, she said yes, because she's never going to say no, because that's what she loves to do. And so this is an invitation. This is not a heavy, but do analyze your heart and do say, you know, is, is ministering to Jesus only singing, or is it I'm going to do what he asked me to do? You know, I think a lot of times we say, I just want to see Jesus, and we never see him in the guy on the street. But that's where Jesus said, we'll recognize him. And I think when we talk about seeing Jesus, we're talking about this raptured prayer experience where I'm in the spirit and I'm seeing him and I don't see him when he's right in front of me, naked and cold and hungry and and thirsty. Well, I do what the message said. Get up and do something and stink. Yeah. You know, rub shoulders with someone who stinks and bless them. You know, I think what Jesus is saying is there's, there's a lot of people who I'm standing next to and they're shivering. You know, the final quest, and I don't mean to go on, that chapter in the final quest convicts the heck out of us. When that homeless guy dies laying on top of another guy. Angelo. Huh? Angelo, I cried. Angelo, Angelo. It convicts us, but not to action. And it needs to turn into action. It was an honor to serve. And uh, did you guys, was I coming against Democrats when I quoted Hillary? All right. Do you know? Do you know? I know preachers that will lose half their church if they bring something like that in. President Trump's done some pretty dumb things. To humans are humans. It was the point of be aware and have a voice when there's something wrong. The context was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, not Democrats and Republicans. If you leave here and you mess that up, you've messed it up. And that is unfair to me and this church. Okay? So we're going to keep going. Next week we'll start talking about this one thing I want to know. But if I haven't taken a two-by-four and a baseball bat to self-righteousness by now, I don't know how much, or the Apostle Paul has through us today. Did you learn something? Yeah? God is good all the time.